Hi, this is Dr. Lauren Loudon, and this is an introduction to the microbes. I want to define the term microbe, talk a little bit about how many of them there are, or maybe how much of them there is on the planet, talk just a little bit about where they are located, how tiny they are, how ancient they are, and how diverse they are. And this is just all going to be um, very introductory. I want you to get excited about the microbial world. I know that I am. I know when I first started learning about microbes, it felt like the story um, when Horton hears the Who's from Dr. Seuss, where you can live your whole life and all you see around you is the visible world, and then suddenly one day you discover that there's this entire world, like layers and layers of worlds. This is like the ultimate and sort of the multiverse and it really exists and it really is all around you and it's just that you need the right tools the right knowledge and the right philosophy to see it and so I'm hoping that you will get excited about this I think if you really pay attention it's impossible not to find something within this world that you can't fall in love with and really get excited about so let's get started though by laying a foundation of knowledge and ideas first of all let's define the term microbe so a microbe is an organism that is too small to be seen without a microscope. And so um, this term gets used for organisms that are also called bacteria and archaea. Collectively, these are the prokaryotic organisms. It also gets used to refer to the fungi, protozoa, and algae. These are all different types of eukaryotes. Um, some algae are macroscopic, many algae are microscopic. And we're going to use the term microbe to refer to the viruses as well, even though they lack cellular structure and are in fact therefore acellular. We're still going to consider them microbes. So a really neat thing about microbes is that they are everywhere. There are so many of them. So we think about them as a multitude. So if you were to look on the bottom of all of the oceans that cover the planets, which is a vast amount of space, it is estimated that there are about one nonillion cellular microbial organisms. So that's 10 to the 30, plus or minus an order of magnitude, because it's actually really hard to figure all this stuff out. If you look at just at dental plaque, if you were to scrape off a whole gram of dental plaque, which is like, it's actually not that hard to do that, disgusting as that might sound, but if you were to scrape a gram off, there would be about 10 to the 11 bacteria alone in that dental plaque. That's not even touching on all the different viruses that are within all of those different bacteria. It's estimated that there are 5 times 10 raised to the power 17 grams of carbon, which is about half the biomass on Earth, that is composed entirely of microbes, primarily prokaryotic microbes in this particular estimation. In other words, a lot, tons and tons, millions of tons of carbon on the planet is microbial. In terms of the number of species, people argue about this and no one's really come up with an amazing perfect estimate, but it's somewhere between 120,000 and 10 to the 7 or 10 million different species of microbes. That's cellular microbes. It's thought that there might be 10 to the 31, which is 10 nonillion different kinds of viruses that are on the planet. In other words, we're just scratching this, the surface of figuring out how many different kinds of organisms and the total mass that we can ascribe or attribute to those organisms on the planet. Hence, I can say with confidence, it's a microbial world, as this cartoon indicates. Where are they? If there's water there, even a minute amount, then there are microbes there. So this is a really great paper that Marino came out with in 2019 that looks at all the different kinds of habitats. There are naturally occurring habitats like sea ice, permafrost, and polar regions. And then there are habitats that we've really created, such as the ones called, um, or the ones that result from acid mine drainage due to human mining activities. All of these different habitats have microbes. Some have a few, some have many. You yourself are a habitat for microbes. So about 50% of the cells 
that make up you, the human being, are actually microbial cells. And also, you're chock full of viruses, and so are the bacteria, the archaea, and the fungi that are on and within you. They're also chock full of viruses. So there's really, it's really at this point in time, hard to say how many different species of organisms make up you or me. We are very much supra-organisms. They are tiny. That's why we can have so many of them on the planet. And it's cool to be tiny. Tiny means to be microscopic. So this star over here at the 100 micrometer boundary of these sizes ranging from 0.1 nanometers to 1 millimeters, 1 millimeters like kind of a thick pencil line if you were to draw it on a piece of paper, this 100 micrometer boundary is the limit of resolution of a typical, you know, good functioning human eye. So we can see things ourselves unaided if they're bigger than 100 micrometers across, and we have to magnify them with a microscope if they're smaller, okay? And so all of these tiny structures include many of the different forms of microbial life, viral and cellular. They also include the cells that make up humans and other animals, and the organelles within some of those cells. So really, really tiny or microscopic. It's part of the definition of being a microbe. The first microscope, just as a point of reference, was invented back in the 1600s by a Dutch draper whose name was Anton or Antony van Leeuwenhoek. He started writing the Royal Society in London around 1660, 1670s, and documenting all of these amazing little tiny critters that, uh, quite frankly, the Royal Society thought had been made up by this crazy guy when they first started looking at the letters that he shared. But they sent observers, and they saw these, these organisms as well. And what he would do is uh, Van Leeuwenhoek invented this microscope. This is a replica of it here. And he could put a little tiny sample on the end of this pin, and then in this little hole there was a little tiny lens, just one single lens. So this was actually a lot like a magnifying glass. And they were cut and polished by Van Leeuwenhoek himself. He was very good at doing this. It was a passion of his. And he was able to magnify specimens 200 times, which allowed him to be the first person, at least in Western knowledge, to document microbial life. He looked at pond water, rainwater, all kinds of amazing things. The microscopes we have today are much more sophisticated and ma can magnify to a greater degree, but we've been using this very fundamental tool to see and study the microbes since the 1600s. So why is it cool to be tiny? Because when you're tiny, you have a super high surface area to volume ratio. And this isn't just a boring math fact. This is actually really important biologically because the higher your surface area to volume ratio is, the more rapidly you can do nutrient and waste exchange, which means the faster that you can grow and the quicker you can respond to your environment. This means you can get really large populations in any given area at a, in a very quick time if conditions favor it. And that also means that these populations mutate very, very quickly. So you can fit a lot of them in, they respond quickly to the environment, they mutate really quickly, and there's some questions for you to think about in, in that regard. And that means that we will see incredible diversity in the microbial world, or we would expect to, and indeed we do. So back in the late 1970s, Carl Woese and Jeffrey Fox published the three domain tree of life that you're looking at here. This is a phylogenetic or evolutionary map of all of the life on Earth. On the tips are all of the known organisms on the planet. Actually, this is just a subset of them because it's kind of impossible to fit them all on here because there are so many different um, groups or taxa that exist today. Only a very small number of these groups, such as the animals and the plants, and then the fungi, because fungi can form structures like mushrooms, only a small number of these groups can grow as multicellular organisms or have to grow as multicellular organisms. Everything else on this three domain tree of life is a microbe. So the bacteria and the archaea, which are organisms that have cells lacking a nucleus, 
every single type of bacteria and every single type of archaea is a microbe. And most of the different taxa found within the domain eukarya are also microbial. So we can easily and confidently say, looking at this map of life, that the vast majority of life on the planet today, by in terms of numbers of different species or taxa, is microbial. We can also say, looking at this tree of life, since this tree of life all branches from a shared common ancestor and from the first pool of cells to form on the planet, these original cells were microbial. And so around four and a half billion years ago, cells actually first formed and started dividing and replicating and life on Earth began. And that initial life, that ancient life, was microbial. These multicellular creatures, they only, they only came around um, on the planet relatively recently in the history of life on Earth. So for the vast amount of time on Earth, most life on the planet has been microbial. So we can say that most life today on Earth is microbial, and we can say that historically for most of the history of life on Earth, that life has been microbial. This is why it makes sense when we go to other planets looking for uh, life. We don't look for things the size of elephants or humans or dogs or even tiny plants. We primarily look for microbes because it's most reasonable to assume that life on other planets, if it exists, is going to be microbial because that's been the story of life on planet Earth. There's a lot of diversity in the different types of microbes that exist on the planet. So if we look at a typical prokaryotic cell, which means cell type that lacks a nucleus, and that includes the, all of the organisms within the, within the domain's bacterium or archaeon, right? And here's your typical cartoon structure of a prokaryotic cell. One or more chromosomes just lumped up in an area called the nucleoid, in cytoplasm, a jelly-like fluid, then you've got a cell membrane, and then you've got um, a cell wall, and then extra to the cell wall structures, things like a capsule, appendages like pili, and a flagellum. And they don't all look like this though. Many of them look like this, but many of them look differently. So if we look just at some of the basic shapes that prokaryotic cells are commonly found um, to look like. We see circular ones, which that shape is called being coccus. This is a rod or bacillus shape. We were just looking at a cartoon of that. Rod shaped is the more modern term. Bacillus is a little bit of an older term. These comma shaped or vibrio shaped cells, ones that are kind of in between and we can't quite make up our minds, so we call them cocobacillus. And then the twisty spirillum and even twistier spirochete. Many interesting pathogens are shaped like this, like Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. It takes advantage of this twisting corkscrew-like shape to actually corkscrew or leverage, it, leverage itself through your or my connective tissue, which is quite tough, to get into our bodies and infect us. A little bit gross, but highly efficient. So lots of diversity in cell shape. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, and they have other membrane-bound organelles, which I won't get into here, but I'll just point out that there's a lot going on within any typical eukaryotic cell. This is an animal cell. It lacks a cell wall. And if we looked at other eukaryotic organisms, this is an image taken from your OpenStax textbook, and it's showing some of the diversity of the group of algae that are called diatoms. And look at all these different fantastic shapes that are shown here. This is a bunch of different diatom cellular shapes, and there's a lot of variety here. So there are many different forms or shapes of eukaryotic cells, lots of diversity. Similarly, the viruses can have a lot of diversity. So this sort of alien, you know, looks like something from a Space Invaders video game. I'm really dating myself here, but I did play Space Invaders as a kid. And so um, this structure represents the typical structure for the sorts of viruses that infect prokaryotic organisms. Those are called bacteriophage. And they've got some genetic material wrapped up in a protein coating called a capsid. All total, this is called the nucleocapsid, and then this entire 
protein-based apparatus, which lets the bacteriophage or virus dock or attach onto a host cell surface. So this would be the host cell, and this would be its surface, and there's a bacteriophage attaching. This is this sort of image is generated using an electron microscope. These are the points on the bacteriophage that facilitate the attaching or docking. And then once that happens, all of this genetic material is inserted or injected into the host cell so it can take it over. It's some really a really cool shape associated with these bacteriophage. Animal and plant viruses have other sorts of shapes. You can have helical, icosahedral, or complex shapes. An example of a helical virus is tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus, an important virus that infects tobacco, which is an agriculturally very important plant, human rhinoviruses, which cause common colds, variola virus, which causes smallpox. Complex viruses steal a little bit of membrane from their hosts, and then they ha use that as uh, a way to help them attach and enter the next host, but lots of diversity in the viral world as well. And so with that, I'm going to conclude this short video lecture and encourage you to go on to learn more about the viral world, not the viral world, the microbial world. You should learn about the viral world too, but learn about all the different microbes.